Professor Andreas Bigfalvi from Bordeaux University in France. So Andreas is a professor of cell and molecular biology at Bordeaux University. He is a leader in research related to tumor microenvironment with special emphasis and interest in brain tumor. Um, Andreas uh, received many awards. Uh, he received the uh, prestigious Henry and Marie Jeanne Mitchell Award for Cancer Research from the uh, National Academy of Medicine. He received uh, an award for outstanding pharmaceutical paper from the Control Release Society, an award from the National Academy of Medicine for his book, an encyclopedic reference in the vascular biology and uh, pathology. Uh, Andreas is the former head of the uh, uh, angiogenesis uh, department and currently is the head of tumor and vascular biology uh, laboratory, first class professor upon decision of the national board of the French universities, exceptional class professor, member of uh, uh, many uh, scientific uh, adv advisory boards, such as the French Anti-Cancer League and the French Cancer Research Association, former member of the Scientific Committee of the European School of Hematology and the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and uh, so on and so forth. So today, Andreas is going to talk about, um, I need my glasses now because I don't have it in front of me, the notion of truth in the biomedical science why it matters and why we must defend it. Andreas, please. Well, thank you very much. So do you hear me? Okay, good. So let's put on the slides now. Okay, so let's, do you see? Okay, thank you very much. So it's a great honor to be, in fact, the first speaker in this session. I would like to thank Ute and all the organizers for this meeting and inviting me. So to this meeting, and uh, I mean, I'm a working cancer researcher, I'm a biologist, physician, and uh, the notion of truth, I think it's extremely important in this area of research. And uh, the problem is that uh, due to recent events, the notion of truth has been attacked and transformed. And we have to a little bit, first of all, clarify what is the notion of truth? and then to see what are the inference on the notion of truth from social, social pressure. Huh? So that's in fact, so I will have in fact two types of, uh, let's, sorry, this is uh, this one right there. So, so I have in fact two types of, uh, of truth, which I will call truth 1.0 and truth 2.0. But first, when you look on the, when you look up the definition of true in the mirror and website, so you have a lot of definitions here. So what you have here, what really stands out to me is a transcendental fundamental spiritual reality, but also the property of statements being in accord with the fact or reality or in a constant to the fact. So in fact, you have, uh, in fact, two types of truths. When you look on, on essentially David Hume on the past, so you have the factual truth, which is the prop uh, propositions according with the fact, which is David Hume's is, what I, what I call true 1.0, and then the prescriptive, the metaphorical ethic, blah, blah, uh, truth, which is David Hume's ought to be, which I call two point, truth 2.0. So you will see, uh, so I will treat, I mean, both. The first part will be shorter, a little bit shorter, and I will devote really a big part to truth 2.0. So how truth 1.0, that means the factual truth, can will uh, um, has to be addressed. First of all, in the science, so, so in biomedicine, for instance, you can have, oh, sorry, this is not going this okay so that's it so uh, so first the biomedical uh, sciences you can have 
hypothesis-driven approach or data-driven approach of inquiry. Then I will more, uh, I, I will uh, explain a little bit more how, what are the procedures to acquire truth in, in the sciences, in biomedicine. Then I will uh, deal a little bit uh, on fluctuation during the path of discovery. Then I will talk about provisional truths and solidified truths, truths and causality. And I will cite uh, the Semmelweis case as an example of the scientific attitude. And uh, so after this, I won't talk in detail about cognitive biases. It will be a little bit included here and uh, not about scientific re relativism, which is surely an important, uh, important topic by its own. So when you look on, in the biomedical science, you have either data-driven approach uh, here or hypothesis-driven approach. The hypothesis-driven approach is the classical approach, how you, how you go, you formulate the hypothesis, then you do experiments, you revalidate. This is the classical in the past. For instance, when you look in, when you look on biology, the, the blood clotting system has been discovered. All the parts of the blood clotting system has been discovered through a hypothesis driven approach. No general screening, uh, and, and all the factors have, have been discovered like this. Now, of course, with all the data science that we have, huge genomic screening, SNPs, so whatever, uh, this has has become really big now. So, so the data-driven approach is really big. But in fact, both approaches are in fact intertwined. The uh, data-driven approach, if you start here, will has to go to hypothesis-driven approach, and so on, and it will uh, create a kind of loop with both. So it's an interacting loop. So there have been two uh, two scientists in the past. So in 2010, there has been uh, Robert Weinberg, I think he was invited here for a meeting, he's an outstanding cancer scientist. And he really said that at that time, that the large the genomic data approach is undermining tried and tested ways of doing and building science. So he was pretty much opposed to, to the data and the counterpoint was in fact, formulated by uh, Ted Gallup, who really uh, has uh, shown that, uh, who really claims that, in fact, this data driven approach uh, gives rise to new hypotheses. In fact, so now this part has become really big, and a lot of science is done now with the data uh, um, um, first approach. So now, the how can we acquire truth in the biomedical sciences? There is the classical inference, causal inference. This is again, I have to go again back. Yeah, so this is the classical causal inference. Classical causal inference has been formulated well by John Stuart Mill. So you, so you compare conditions and so forth. You have to have uh, um, an association between these conditions. You have to exclude background. Uh, causes and then you will have um, and then you can make a causal inference. Then the other thing is the Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics very important biomedicine, especially in, in genetics, genomics, and, and and also other approaches. Then there's the error statistical approach, inference of the best explanation. So the inference of the best explanation is when you know, for instance, the structure of a protein, a receptor, and you know uh, ligand, so you can predict to some extent that the response will be this one. So the protein will bind to this. So you have already uh, an inference that can go to a good and best explanation. Uh, so, so in terms of the structure. And then you have the nomological network of cumulative evidence that is uh, like like Charles Darwin did, in fact, it's a kind of wheel, you know? So you have one argument, one other, blah, blah, and it goes around and you have so many arguments either that exclude or include that will uh, that will really uh, reinforce a hypothesis. And then you have the causal re revolution that is uh, uh, has also been ongoing. 
So now, the, so the causal revolution quickly, the causal theories, it's a very important point now. And there's one, uh, there's one person very important in the causal revolution, Ju Judah Pearl. He, uh, this is from his book. So with, he defined the causal ladder, that is the associations or seeking. This is the normal frequentist, uh, frequentist approach that you have here. Then what, uh, in the second step, you have the interventionist approach, so doing, and then the uh, third letter is the counterfactual. So, uh, so, so what if, and and what is not? If if this will not occur, what will happen then? And of course, uh, Judah Pearl is an is in the A, in in the artificial intelligence AE, and he he tries to uh, make a computer speak. In terms of counterfactual, so uh, so that's the uh, that's an important point. So in causality, you can draw causality diagrams now, and it's very important now also in biology to to determine what is a primary cause, a secondary cause, because the system is very very complex. And then of course in the philosophical realm, in that there's the interventionist causality by James Woodward. So. Uh, now, what I call solidified truth. So, people, of course, I agree with uh, with scientists globally that the truth is only provisional. That you have hypothesis, you test them, you you reject, and you go. On. But in biology, there is something like a solidified truth, and I will show you how. So, you can have fluctuations, uncertainties. Then the theory gets stable, you have some certainties that can be more permanent or only transitory, and it goes on and on like this. And this is a kind of spiral where you gain uh, where you gain more and more truth. So the solid examples on biology about solidified truth is this one. You have the cell theory, you have the germ theory, blood circulation system in vertebrates, uh, you have uh, the, the uh, re respiration energetics, you have DNA as the substance of heredity, and you have MRS in stable intermediate for protein synthesis. So this, if you would knock out, for instance, the cell theory and would say this is just uh, a provisional truth, then you could do any more science in biology. Okay. So the thing is that it's really, uh, let's say, more, more stable it's a kind uh, this uh, this has become frameworks for research so now just for the scientific attitude an example a quick example which is ignaz semmelweis so he was a hungarian so i it's hungarian like me in fact so i cite this i cite this because of uh, uh, not because of that but because of the example that has been treated by in fact Carl Hempel, who was an important philosopher of science. So what the uh, the uh, so what uh, he he observed that uh, in fact the childbed fever. You know the so women uh, they get childbed fever and they died at enormous rate when uh, they they deliver. In fact. And he had the chance in one hospital to have two departments, one department and the second department here. In one department, the mortality rate was really high. And in other, it was lower. And the difference was that here, the physicians, the MDs were examining the patients. And here, there were only the nurses doing that. So uh, to make a long story short, he did a lot of of, uh, of, of questioning, also experimental and provisional questioning, and came up that, uh, in fact, it's due to the fact that the hands were dirty and they were dirty with, uh, they, were, they were in fact infected because the physicians, they did sectioning uh, dead people, so in the morning, and then they uh, examined the women. And then he introduced the chlorine wash, which is in, which is in fact an intervention here, and bomb the the mortality rate 
went down. So what he did, in fact, is a nomological network of cumulative evidences that you see here. So if, for instance, they, he had uh, different mortality rates in, uh, in the maternities, then uh, he compared the historical re record on, on the sections, when they were performed or not, and he concluded that uh, the periods with no dissections, there were low, low mortality of the women. Then there's a time-dependent fluctuation, of course, uh, which is related to the sections. Then uh, the rate was higher, sorry, it's, it's time there. So, so the rate was higher in uh, when, when other people, foreigners, were, were performing their sections. And the because they they were trained so when they had the training in the morning they were doing the dissections they examined the, the women afterwards so uh, they he excluded external uh, psychological factors the gassen geworden that means uh, geworden outside of the hospital on the on the street there were much lower infection rates and uh, uh, so a friend of him had, in fact, he, uh, he did a dissection, he cut his finger and he had the same symptoms as the, as the women with the fever, with the child with fever and the same symptoms and the same uh, uh, occurrence. And then he did an intervention with the Glockhalt lösung. And then uh, his theory was a little bit enlarged because it was not only cadavers, but also infected organs, for instance, uh, a woman who had the cervix cancer was examined and he transferred the germs to uh, the other patients or the, the infected knee was the same. So, and then he did experiments in rabbits. They injected the exudates of patients and he reproduced the same symptoms. So this is what scientists, in fact, in our, this is an old example, but what scientists, in fact, doing now. And we have to follow a little bit uh, this uh, way of doing science. And he concluded that it was external septic factor. So it was not the others, like uh, the, the, the other scientists that came afterwards who formulated hypothesis, but he was the first who concluded for a septic factor. And at that time, the germ theory did not exist. So now the so there were the uh, Carl Gustav Hempel was an important philosopher from the Berlin cycle. He was uh, related to the Vienna cycle also to some extent, and he went to Princeton, and he became a professor there, and he analyzed the uh, this uh, uh, case also uh, more more broadly, of course, like uh, like you see here the elimination by simple observational facts, then uh, the interventionist approach, like priest ringing bell, preg the position of pregnant woman, and also the, the washing with the chlorine. And then uh, the, uh, so, so the hypothesis-driven approach of Semmelweis, which was hy hypothesis and the test implications. So you have two cases, H is true, so is the, the test implication, but if, I, the test implication is not true, then H is not true. But then you have the fallacy of affirming the consequent. That means you have H is true, and so are uh, the, uh, the implication, test implications. As the evidence show that H, some of the H are true, but this is a line that is not uh, finished, so you have m much more. And then H, you may conclude that H is true, but this is not uh, really the case, so you cannot do it because it's a fallacy of affirming the consequent. So it's, I do science, I do only verification, according to the verificationist principle, I go and go and I try, I look just for data that support what I'm thinking. So that's exactly what a lot of people also in social science are doing. Uh, so <laughs> this is one of the quicks. So now truth 2.0, which is really the uh, more uh, what is more into the frame of this meeting. So you have, uh, in fact, of course, science and society has has a strong interaction and are interdependent. So they, of course, some of the values of the of the society and the politics, like grant funding and so on, will will automatically 
go into science and affect science. But the other thing, other thing is that the ideological the penetration and driven by political activism is very different. So the classical example is Lysenko and Vavilov, you know, so also in Russia, because the genetics uh, at that time was not, uh, in fact, according to the wisdom of the Soviets. And uh, Vavilov was a geneticist, so he died in prison. So now the, we have to discuss a little bit what are the value, and this comes already from the Welturteilsstreit, Max Weber, so we know, so we know that. But it is reborn now. It comes really back now, really heavily. And there's a more recent book by a, a person named Elliot, The Tapestry of Values. So what he claims and says this case show, so they examined uh, a number of things in the science, that value-free ideal is problematic and values have an important role to play. And uh, so the conditions here, in fact, uh, he, is, he claims that, uh, in fact, making value judgments more explicit actually promotes objectivity. So that's the his claim, and we should be really careful what he says here. And the influence of value should be made transparent. So more value you show, you have into science, so, so the better he claims is for objectivity. But which values and who is determining it? What type of research is allowed and not allowed? How to distinguish science that we should do and science that we should not do? And is there a, a, a minimal framework for, for values? And there's, of course, the difference between values and, be, and belief and values and ideology. So this is because all this is put together in one, one pot. So... Uh, he refers to the contextual um, um, empirism of um, um, Helen Longino. So, the, uh, so what she claims in the contextual uh, empirism that, in fact, observation and data are not themselves evidence for or against the particular hypothesis. The relevance of any particular data and given hypothesis decided by human beliefs and assumptions even when the relevance of evidence is decided, there may be a logical gap between evidence and full justification of scientific theory bridging by beliefs and assumptions. To some extent, we can be, so we can agree with that, but not fully, because for instance, in the first, in the first part, there are observations and data, they by themselves can reject, validate an hypothesis. They are, I mean, you can, for instance, when I show you the Semmelweis case, you see. So the data that are really going against. So that's to me is, uh, is an overstatement. Then the other problem is that in fact, uh, uh, there is an inflation of the art in her theory. That means how it should be. And uh, the problem is when you look on this, it will be in principle, her, her values scheme is that uh, values, principles and methods that would make it impossible to accept racist, sexist and similar theories into methodological basis of science. So uh, in fact, she does not trust the scientific enterprise to deal with it because one has a racist hypothesis, you can clearly show through uh, to data that it's absolutely false. Okay, so the, he does, but you have to already circumscribe the area. So from the beginning, and that's to me is a problem. However, one of her one of her key ideas is interesting: that production of knowledge is a social enterprise uh, secured through critical cooperative interaction of inquiries. If that's true, and uh, with that we can agree. But 
the counterpoint is, is Bertrand Russell. So when you look on Bertrand Russell, uh, so, so intellectually the effect and mistaken moral consideration upon, upon philosophy, so you can put instead of philosophy science here, has been to impede progress in an extraordinary extent. And he justified this here in his book very clearly. So uh, morally, a philosopher who uses his professional competence for anything except a disinterested search of truth is guilty of a kind of treachery. And he is a kind of, uh, let's say, premonitory uh, uh, thing here, phrases here, when any limits are placed consciously, unconsciously upon the pursuit of truth, philosophy, or science becomes about, uh, uh, under par paralyzed by fear, and the ground is prepared for government censorship for punishing those who utter dangerous thoughts. In fact, the philosopher or scientist has already placed such a censorship over his own investigation. So that's, in fact, what's happening a lot at the present day. So uh, examples against the, the theory that, in fact, uh, you have to follow uh, um, so present-day assumptions. So present-day assumptions for Harvey, the discovery of the blood circulation system, was uh, the assumption that gallon, the blood, there was no blood circulation system. Blood was flowing from, uh, from the heart, from the outside, to the periphery and was transformed into flesh. So that was the theory. And there was also an oxy oxygenation device, that means the, the red blood, but that comes from the lung to the heart. And there were no difference between veins and, uh, and, and arteries at that time. But he took a pure empiricist approach. He said, I will look at it. And he, he, he dissected. This was not because of any beliefs. If, 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 if he would have followed the belief system, he would be stood here. And the other is the Semmelweis case. In his play, in his time, the belief and assumption of purple fever was the miasma theory. That means kind of vapors that were, were diffusing from, from dead bodies uh, through walls and so forth, and also psychogenic and other causes uh, that was there. And then he did also a pure empiricist approach, breaking with the current assumption and belief system. Okay, So that is important. So what we have, value-free and value la la uh, 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 so dependent on love and science. So in, in one respect, you have some values because every scientist has some values. The, uh, for instance, in, in biomedical research, you want to heal, treat people. You want to, that your research is profiting to the society. That's a, a, that's a kind of general value. But when it comes to hypertrophy of the odd, so this is the, the odd of Hume, so... When it comes to hypertrophy of odd, it will impact strongly to the east and will then decide what has to be done in science, what can go and what cannot go. What can go and not go. And that we are at present day. So that's very important. So, of course, there's a, a context of value. So where, where the present attack uh, is now... Uh, how this present attack can be explained. So it's, it starts, in fact, from, from the Marxist theory, from cultural Marxist, Ramshi Lukács, and then it went in three layers. In fact, uh, one was the critical theory with Horkheimer, Adorno, and Marcuse, which then became critical race theory, Bell, Crenshaw, Hooks, and so on, and intersectionality, and this has... Uh, been uh, been then imported into the society in a large in a large scale. Then you have postmodern philosophers, of course, they, they are very important, Foucault and Derrida and others, which are strongly connected to gender and queer theory, and also had an impact in in education in universities and also in the society in general. And then there were the decolonization movement, which is a South American. So, so movement at the at its origin, 
And this is also has, has impacted strongly. So what, and as an amplification, so this is an guitar amplifier here, uh, but uh, this, uh, this is not a guitar who will be amplified, but uh, in fact, the social media is doing the amplification here. And uh, then uh, all the big companies and stuff went on the, uh, and so forth. And what I call gendered and racialized capitalo Marxism. That's what we have, in fact, now. And this goes that uh, broad, has a broad impact into society. So that's Okay, so how science and me medicine is attacked at the present day. First, it's attacked in its epidemic foundations with standpoint epistemology, anti-modernity, anti-Western critical race theory, white supremacist culture theory. So we have people in the social science who are doing this kind of, of thing. Then practically also in society, decolonizing and debunking things, then the, so the whiteness and Eurocentrism is another and race and gender criteria that are applied. And in practice, this will translate to hiring students and faculty based on group identity, cancel culture, DE requirements for jobs, pu publication, abstracts, meetings, citation justice, which is the new, new big thing in science uh, and the medical education uh, that is where you have anti-racist requirements and medical treatment tailored to group identity, okay? So in this sense, how biomedical research and clinical practice should be done since its foundations are racist and sexist. It should be replaced, we should replace these epistemic foundations. Then we should debunk racism, sexism really everywhere and reduce every health differential to these factors. We should tailor treatment according to CRT and gender criteria. Okay, so this is the total, what we call the total treason of the fiduciary duty. So the fiduciary duty, there was a nice substack from Jonathan Haidt. So uh, he claimed that the, the fiduciary duty is a concept that's extremely useful and uh, people working on anti-racism statements. Uh, so that will cause professor to violate the, the fiduciary duty. And they are important. So the fiduciary duty for science is truth and the fiduciary duty for teaching is, is education, good education that is, uh, that is based on reason. So what, the question, of course, is what is the telos of science? Either you can choose truth or social justice. So that's the, the way it goes. And uh, um, I think this is an important one. So uh, now some examples for the ideology penetration. So this is nature, a lot systemic. You have systemic racism. Science must listen. These are all these ones, better science to admit that you are not objective. This is, uh, this is very awkward here. Then uh, dismantle racism, human genetic needs an anti-racism plan. So 2021, all this then in the Lancet, this importation of critical race theory in, in, in the practice, in the clinical practice. So that's extremely awkward and uh, is promoted by the Lancet. Then in the science here news, they do also the autoflagellation, self-flagellation. I am bad, my past was bad. I'm, so, I mean, this is a classical, would you say a, a little bit the Christian way to, so to deal with it. I'm a sinner, so I put, I, uh, I, I'm a bad person, so I have to, to repent and so forth. So here is, Here's with nature, this is also autoflagellation of present. It's not only past injuries, they don't only cancel the past, but they cancel also recent things. That is absolutely awkward. Then there is also science. Uh, so nature, human behavior is a strong culprit. They're strong, they are really very, because they claim that you have to be very, uh, very, very, very prudent 
because even people that are not into your research program may be hurt and you have to exclude any harm to these people who are not related to your research. So for instance, uh, so I don't know, a Mormon or something, uh, someone like this, or uh, uh, who, who believes in, so in that kind of stuff and you, you are attacking, you're attacking them, then it's not, uh, it's not right at all. And there's also this kind of Kiev article, uh, which is interesting, on the fall of nature uh, as a journal. And uh, even creationists is doing the job now. So it's not only from the West. So this guy, this person, James D. West, is uh, in the creationist in, in the Creation Institute in, in I think in Seattle. And the other one here, this is science of communication science. We have to acknowledge the supremacist culture in science, so they have to they have to introduce uh, this type of thinking into into science. Uh, uh, and now moral prescriptions uh, into neuroscience. So there are two uh, that are promoting this. These are two twin sisters here. Uh, uh, Danny uh, Bassett here and Perry Zurn. So these are two twin sisters, and they are really heavily into this. I mean, they are they are uh, they are doing. They have written um, a number of papers for science. I, I mean, justice. Uh, so citation justice. How how does it work to mitigate gender imbalance and race race imbalance? You have to screen your citations. Okay, so you have to screen your citations and uh, you have to screen them with specific program software algorithms. So they, they will sort out, uh, so, so too many uh, so male first authors or uh, that are white. And, uh, and so there are four criteria, male, women, uh, black, no three criteria, black, and they, these, these are in fact associated Man, uh, white, man, black, women, white or black, first or last auto. Okay, and then they screen this, and you have to uh, to do what they call citation justice, and this is uh, very hooked up with uh, with Crenshaw with the intersectional experience of r racialized, ethnic, genderized class persons, and the other is. Uh, the, the findings that in that study they get, it's, uh, it's still a preprint that the women of color are significantly more undecided than white men and men of color and slightly more undecided than white, white women. And it compounds the compound effect of intersection of gender and race and ethnic bias. So we are biased in citations. Okay, I will uh, stop soon. So this is another example uh, that you have the diversity statements here. I have to do a lot of diversity statements. Here also it's in physics, but uh, I think Anna will talk about that uh, a little bit more in detail. Uh, especially the, the attack that science uh, is not so performed by a lone genius, especially white genius, but by, uh, I, I mean, all other identities should be, should be acknowledged for that. And it has been penetrated also in teaching, medical teaching, and for instance, M Michelle Moss in, uh, in teaching and in clinical practice. So she states that in fact, uh, racism is the, risk, uh, is the risk factor, not race. Okay, so racism will, uh, will produce all the harm and the, on, the, on the biology of people. And this has, uh, been supported by the Lancet, has been supported by the New England Journal of Medicine. There's a lot for the American Medical Association also. And unfortunately, some of these people here, uh, this person one, they are a little bit linked to anti-Semitism and anti-Israel pro propaganda. Okay. So this is just, uh, just uh, at the, uh, and this is an example of shabby reasoning um, on correlations that 
could raise this as a risk factor. Of, well, this is really shabby reasoning, uh, so at all. And uh, okay, and more examples where racism is a proxy of physiological uh, differences, because uh, there has been an issue in nature on that. And this was one of the articles, very strange that this has been used. And our good friend, Philip Ball, who, who also did uh, write this, that in fact, Huxley and uh, his people uh, and the past was also, also racist and we have to acknowledge all that. And what we have here, just a final example, is Paul Boca. So, so Paul Boca is very heavily attacked now, even in France. Paul Boca was the founder of anthropology. Uh, he uh, did fundamental work in neuroscience, neurology, and worked in many other domains. Really, he was a free thinker, materialist, strong critic for the bourgeoisie uh, and caring for the poor, helped to fund the assistance, assistance publique, which is the hospitals in uh, in France and elected as a, for the left standard of life and the cons eugenist and racist. So for the present time, if you do presentism, he's a racist and sexist. But in fact, when you uh, look on the context, he's not. So you have contamination. This is an ideological ideological device that is uh, you have to pre concept that is an extension of uh, of uh, of concepts to other domains and other areas. And uh, then you have psychological contamination and hurt behavior and strategic equivocation, which is the mod and, and, and daily policy. So that's what you have. And this is to end psychogenic, I compare this to a psychogenic epidemic. So, so Carl Gustav Jung, he formulated this very nicely. It's not famine, not earthquakes or microbes, not cancer, but he, himself, man himself, who is the man and greatest danger to man for the simple reason that there's no adequate protection against psych psychic epidemic, which are infinitely more devastating in the worst of natural ca catastrophes. And this is uh, reorganizing. You can reorganize all the collective feelings. And I will end here. So this is Gustave Le Bon, uh, so the psychology of uh, the, the psychology de full, and he really he analyzed this crowd crowd behavior re really extensively. So I think I will stop now. Yeah. <laughs> it was maybe a little bit long, but uh, it's uh, I, so I think it's useful for you to to see what so what is going on in that area of. Uh, of work.